Thank you, Brother Bland. I appreciate that very much. I've enjoyed the day with you so far, enjoyed the morning, certainly enjoyed the meal together. And I also want to echo Brother Bland what he said earlier uh, about the decor over there. I want to commend the, the students' wives that looked great over there. I appreciate your work uh, so much as well. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Imagine with me a child going to a tutor for help. And when he arrives, the tutor asks, well, well, what should we work on today? And they proceed to mention a few things that the child needs uh, to be learning and should be learning, and then, uh, and then basically wing it. Talking a little bit about math and maybe a dip, multiple branches of math and a little bit of English, and maybe a little bit of science. And they discuss these subjects for about an hour or so, and the child is left a bit overwhelmed, maybe a bit confused, having heard a lot about various subjects, but actually learning very little or anything. It would be much more effective if that tutor had a study plan in place. A study plan that he could implement, establishing certain foundational concepts, uh, understanding where that child is in, in his development and continuing to build on that um, so that that child can grow as much as possible and that tutor can be as effective as possible in the work that he's trying to accomplish with that child. I certainly appreciate the topic that's been given to me. I certainly appreciate uh, uh, that because sometimes Bible studies can go something like that. It can go a lot like that situation with the tutor. Oh, well, we've got an appointment. That's exciting. We're sitting down for a Bible study with this person. That's exciting. Well, what interests you from the Bible? What, what do you want to talk about? And then we wing it, essentially. Uh, bringing in a number of different Bible topics with, with little concern for a systematic approach where one thing builds upon another. Brethren, we need a plan if we're going to be effective in Bible study situation. If we're going to be effective in personal evangelism, we need a plan. We need a method that we can use to be as effective as we possibly can. We're dealing with a soul here. We're dealing with a person's eternity. It's far too important just to sit down without a plan and basically wing it on a Bible study. Or, or maybe, maybe we have a plan in place for, for the basic subject matter we want to study, a step-by-step -step progression. But maybe our technique of teaching leaves that student confused leaves that student thinking that the study was the perspective of the teacher, but maybe not necessarily God's truth. It's extremely important because of that, um, that we have a plan both for the progression of subjects and have an effective teaching technique in place. So we're going to talk this hour about resources that we can use, things that, uh, the materials that are available to us uh, to, to put to work for the, for the Lord in personal event. I want to focus mainly on personal evangelism, and I'll define that further in just a moment, but also technique, a method that we can use. We'll touch on some of that um, as well uh, at this time. Uh, now, as was mentioned, I I teach the Fishers of Men Evangelism training course. That's a 12-week training course in person-to-person, -person, an intensive 12-week training course in person-to-person -person evangelism. I cannot teach the full 12-week course today, um, but I'm going to give you a couple of tools that I think can really, really help in making us better teachers on, in the one-on-one -on -one teaching situation. So let's begin by talking about resources. Uh, and as I want to share with you, you something that I found very interesting in, uh, in preparation 
for, uh, for this study. Uh, I, I asked uh, on a few social media groups about materials uh, that people use. I, didn't, I, I know of a number of materials uh, that are used and designed specifically for personal evangelism, but I didn't want just, well, this is what I know of. I, I want to know what other brethren are using as well. Uh, I know there are a number of things that maybe I don't know about. And also let me preface by saying that the materials that I'm going to show to you and briefly mention, uh, by no means is this an exhaustive list of resources available to you. Uh, but these, these are some things that I know of uh, that you might find helpful um, as well. But I asked on multiple social media groups that were supposed to be members, of, I stress supposed to be members of the church. Uh, and some of them were and some of them had a very large variety in them. But I put it out there and there were um, uh, tens of thousands of people. In these groups, combined with the groups that I, I put this on, on there, there were tens of thousands of people on these groups for members of the church. And I asked, what are, what are you using uh, for personal evangelism? What are some materials that you use? And I gave a few examples of things that I uh, was, was aware of. And of those tens of thousands of people that were in those groups, you know how many responses I got? Two. You know how many helpful suggestions I got? Zero. And I wasn't sure what to think about that. I really wasn't sure what to think about that. Are, are there not any other materials other than, one, other than the ones I mentioned in the post to give examples of what I was talking about? Or are people just not involved in personal evangelism? I wasn't sure uh, what, the, what the case was. But either way... It re-emphasized to me the importance of presenting some simple things that I'm going to present to you. And also the need to train brethren to be more active and effective in personal evangelism. Now I want to start by mentioning uh, a few correspondence courses. And I slipped and moved that slide earlier, but that's okay. Um, my focus here is not on correspondence courses. I'm also going to mention uh, briefly some, uh, some videos that are useful for personal evangelism as well. My focus is not on videos. I want my focus this morning to be on one-on-one -on -one personal contact, eyeball to eyeball, back and forth with an open Bible, uh, and that sort of thing. But I will briefly mention some correspondence courses, some that you, you are probably familiar with. Uh, the John Hurt uh, it's got an eight-lesson uh, eight series and also a 12-lesson uh, uh, series as well. Uh, the, the Freeman Correspondence Course, that's a 25-lesson series. A Firm Foundation uh, Correspondence Course, that is a 16-lesson series. And also the Acts of the Apostles series put out by uh, David Farr. Also, uh, I wanted to mention the Apologetics Press. Uh, that's the one on the, the, the bottom, on the right side at the bottom there, um, Apologetics Press also has a correspondence course that uh, has, it's actually three correspondence courses with ten lessons in each. Um, of course, it's Apologetics Press is naturally going to focus on Christian evidence primarily. However, it does also address things like the church and what God expects of us and eternal destiny uh, and that sort of thing. So those are some tools. If you uh, have a need or, or, or focus primarily on correspondence courses, those are some tools that are available to you. As I said, that's not an exhaustive list. Um, but I also do want to mention some videos that you might find useful. Again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just a few examples of things that um, I'm aware of that you might find helpful in your work as well. Um, many of you are familiar with the Jewel Miller videos. They used to be film strips and they're available in video form now. The Five Lesson series uh, did a lot of good and has continued to do a lot of good in the Lord's Church and has for a long time. Uh, but also World Video Bible School which has been uh, mentioned more than once already today. Uh, they do a lot of good work, put out a lot of good material uh, in the area of videos that are useful for Christian growth, but also for evangelism uh, as well. Uh, perhaps the most useful one in the area of person-to-person -person evangelism um, is the one called Searching for Truth. And uh, it's a, uh, 
I can't remember how many video, videos it is now. I think it's a series of four or five uh, videos just designed to teach someone how to become a Christian. Uh, very useful uh, for that as well. And of course, they have a number of other uh, videos that are very useful for personal evangelism as well. But also Apologetics Press, uh, I wanted to mention them. They put out a number of uh, great tools and even videos uh, primarily focused on the existence of God and the evidence for God and the evidence for the Bible and the inspiration of the Bible um, and so forth. So I wanted to mention some of those tools uh, with correspondence courses and videos, but I did not want that to be the main focus today. I want to talk about person-to-person -person evangelism because there are different types of evangelism. Preaching in a pulpit to a group of people that is a type of evangelism. But I don't, I, don't, I don't teach people how to preach sermons when I teach Fishers of Men. That's not where we focus today. Handing out tracts to people, that's a type of evangelism. And as I mentioned, with videos and, and, uh, and uh, correspondence courses, those are types of evangelism. But I'm talking about personal evangelism, one-on-one -on -one. Eyeball to eyeball, so to speak. Back and forth conversing with people across their kitchen table. What are some tools that we can use to help us to do that more effectively? Some resources, and then we'll talk about some technique uh, that we can use. Here are some examples of materials that are available for that type of personal work, personal evangelism. Some of these, and by the way, um, don't, do not expect me to reveal some groundbreaking, earth-shattering new material that you've never seen before that's going to change the... No, don't expect that from me. Um, but here are some tools that I know of. Some of most, you're probably familiar with most of these. Some of you are familiar with all of them, I'm sure. But here are some things that I'm aware of that are very useful uh, in this area of person-to-person evangelism. And I will try and describe, I'm not going to go in length about each one, but I will try to describe what you can expect uh, to see uh, in, in each one of these uh, sets of material. I'll begin with the Open Bible Study uh, series. That's a series of three lessons you see, uh, see it pictured there in the top left corner. That's the Open Bible Study uh, series. Someone says, well, you said it's three, but I see four there. Well, there's a worksheet that goes with it. It's a series of three lessons with an accompanying worksheet uh, to go along uh, with it. And this study begins with the all-sufficiency of the Bible, uh, and it goes through obeying the gospel and, of course, the need to be faithful. Um, now, as you can see, and as we mentioned, it's a very short series, only three lessons. Because of that, there is a, an, a tremendous need for follow-up continued growth. If you choose to use the Open Bible Study series, plan for follow-up studies, continued growth after you finish uh, that very short series. Also, something else worth mentioning uh, about this series it, is it does not uh, provide evidence for the existence of God. It does not provide evidence for the inspiration of the Bible. It begins with that position. The Bible is inspired and God exists uh, and, and goes from there. Um, and I'll talk more about the need for that type of study as we move along just a little bit further. Um, but now, also, you see on the very bottom, the center bottom, you see uh, the Does It Matter series. Uh, Brother uh, Ratana mentioned this series when he was uh, in, in a video that you just saw uh, before lunch. Um, this is a nine-lesson series. Uh, begins with the authority uh, of the Bible and, and, and goes through obeying the gospel. And although it is a nine-lesson series... Um, how to be saved, how to have your sins forgiven, is right at the very end. Um, so you need, to, if you're going to use that, you need to plan on uh, continued study. Uh, hopefully a person becomes a Christian at the end of that. Well, they're not finished. So you need a plan for continued study uh, after you've completed this series to help them continue to grow and mature. Um, uh, in, the, in their faith. Also, uh, like the Open Bible Study series, it does not provide uh, evidence for God 
or evidence for the inspiration of the Bible. So plan for that as well, because those are some things that have to be established uh, for your study to be effective uh, as well. Um, I'll talk for a moment about, uh, about the Back to the Bible series. You see it pictured there in the top right corner of the screen. Uh, the Back to the Bible series, it is a, a three-lesson series uh, as well. And it uh, begins uh, with authority. Uh, lesson one is the authority of the Bible. Uh, lesson two goes into the church. And then the third and final lesson goes into sin and how to be saved from sin. Um, as you can see there with it only being three lessons, it is a very, very short uh, series uh, of lessons. But of, of, all of these contain good scriptural material. Um, as far as I know, if there's something in there that, it's, that I didn't know about, let me know. Uh, but as far as I know, all of this is good scriptural material. However, with this being a very short series, you need some follow-up um, uh, to help the person continue to grow like some of the others that I've already, already mentioned. Uh, additionally, although it begins with authority, um, it gives no evidence for the authority of the Bible uh, as being inspired and evidence for God uh, and so forth. Like others that I've already mentioned, it begins or starts with the perspective that God is uh, and that the Bible is from Him and then it, it builds on it but doesn't really provide evidence for that. Um, however, uh, it's my understanding that that is why the Believe the Bible series uh, was written. And so, well, that's next one we want to talk about. It's right below the bottom right corner of the screen, right below the uh, Believe the Bible, or the Back, the Back to the Bible series. It, like, like the Back to the Bible series, the Believe the Bible series is also three lessons. Um, and it's designed to be used, the way I understand it anyway, it's designed to be used with the Back to the Bible uh, series. And it provides evidence for the existence of God. How can we know there is a God? Um, it gives evidence for who Jesus is uh, and evidence for how we know the Bible is the inspired Word uh, of God. Um, and you can't see it on the screen there, but across the bottom of each of those lessons, the Believe the Bible lessons, it's, it's called Supplemental Lesson. Um, I don't like that word, uh, Supplemental Lesson. Just my personal thought there. Uh, I, I don't think the material in those are supplemental. I think they're essential. Uh, you, you, we have to establish, when we're in a Bible study with someone, we have to establish the existence of God and how the Bible, we know the Bible is from Him. Because if we do not establish that, we have no foundation on which to build. We'll talk about that more. Uh, as, as we continue on. So I view these as essential lessons. Uh, even if you don't use those lessons, particularly the material in them is essential to establish the existence of God and the Bible being from God and who Jesus is. And then you can move forward. Now, what does the Bible say? Um, so if you're using the uh, Back to the Bible series, I encourage you either use the Believe the Bible series first or have some very similar type of material. Same thing with the Open Bible series uh, and the, uh, the Does It Matter series. You have to establish the existence of God. You have to establish the inspiration of the Bible and so forth so that you have a foundation on which uh, uh, to, uh, to build. We'll, we'll expand on that a little bit more in just a few minutes. Uh, at the bottom left corner of the screen there, you see pictured um, the uh, You Can Be Sure series. Uh, that's a five-lesson series put out by our own brother Billy Bland, and it does start uh, with, a, uh, with the existence of God and evidence of the Bible and, and so forth. And this series is, I find it to be unique in the fact that it, is, it can be very easily used as a sit-down, person-to-person evangelism study guide. It can also be very effectively used as a correspondence course, and it's available online. Uh, as well. So it's, it's, I think it's unique uh, in, in that way. It's a five-lesson five series, and as I mentioned, it begins with those foundational issues of uh, the existence of God and how we know the Bible is from God, and then moves into sin and salvation and, and the church and, and faithfulness. Um, and, but of course, with it being five lessons, it's still on the shorter side, so you're going to need some follow-up 
uh, even after that series is done, to be sure that new, uh, hopefully new Christian at that point is, uh, is continuing to grow and develop uh, as, as they should. Then, in the top center of the, the, the screen there is pictured the Search for Truth series. Uh, that is a 16-lesson series so far. I say so far because we're still building on it. It's a slow process. Um, but this is what I use. Uh, this is what we use during the Fishers of Men training course. Um, some who know a little bit about Fishers of Men uh, know, what the fisher, know what the Search for Truth lessons are. And they think that's Fishers of Men. Don't confuse that. The Search for Truth series is a big part of Fishers of Men. But the Fishers of Men training course is much, much bigger than the Search for Truth series. If, you, if someone here has gone through the Fishers of Men training course, you know that. Uh, the Search for Truth series is a big part of Fishers of Men. It's what we use for the personal Bible studies in, during the course. Um, but it's only a, a part of the course. The course itself is much bigger. Uh, and actually, uh, when the 12-week when the training course is over with, the Fisher's Men training course is over with, although we use, the course, use this material during the course, when the course is over with, if students decide, you know what, I like this other set of material better for doing personal work, great, fine, do that, and you can still use the Fisher's of Men teaching technique that we taught you during the course. Fishers of Men is not about the material. It's about a technique of interaction. It's about being a more effective teacher uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and also, also I, don't, I want to be very clear on this as well. Anybody can use the SFTs. Search for, we call those SFTs, the Search for Truth Lessons. Uh, anybody can use them. Uh, whether you've gone through the Fishers of Men course or not, you can use them. Um, but, of course, we in the course will teach you how to present material, biblical material in a more effective way uh, than perhaps you have done in the past. But this series begins with the existence of God uh, it, and the evidence for the Bible and who is Jesus. And, and, and like others, from this point, like others, it goes into the authority. Like what is authority? Where is our authority today? And then goes into sin and how to be saved uh, and what specifically what Jesus did because of sin and tries to move us to an appreciation for that and then builds up into the the church and then unlike most other series designed specifically for personal evangelism it continues to build from there um, and goes through discipleship prayer unity adding to your faith becoming a mature christian being a christian husband and wife and we have plans for more. Uh, lesson 17 is in the works. It's not finished yet, but it's a natural follow-up. Lessons 15 and 16 are Christian husband, Christian wife. Lesson 17, we plan on being godly Christian parents. Uh, and then lesson 17, we plan, uh, excuse me, lesson 18, we plan to uh, have the subject of brotherly love. As we just continue to build uh, on, on these and continue to help a new Christian uh, continue to grow and mature uh, in the faith. But the main thing, brethren, besides, of course, being scriptural, the main thing is have a plan. Say, have a step-by-step -step plan building up one thing upon another. I think it's very important, as I mentioned, to start with the existence of God and the evidence for the inspiration of the Bible because those things simply cannot be assumed. I've alluded to that already. You cannot assume, especially in the world in which we live right now, those things simply cannot be assumed. You have to establish that with the evidence. If a person has a doubt about God and about the Bible and what the Bible, if they have a doubt about that, then what the Bible says about Jesus, what the Bible says about sin, what the Bible says about salvation and the church, all of that is meaningless to that person if they doubt the authenticity of the Bible and even if God exists. So we have to establish those things first so we have a foundation on which to build. Additionally, um, for the most part, we need to plan for continued study, uh, continued encouragement and growth even after finishing one of these uh, series that you see uh, on the screen there. Because, brethren, the reality of the situation is this. We lose too many new converts. We lose too many. 
How often does it happen that a person obeys the gospel and you might see them for a week or two or three and then they're gone? We lose too many new converts. We don't have enough new converts and we lose many of the ones we get. We have to have a plan in place for continued growth and, and continued study for those new uh, members of the body of Christ. Here are some materials to use for that. Some that I'm familiar with. Uh, you may be familiar with them as well. The one on the right there has been around for a long time. I'm sure you're familiar with that one. Why I'm a member of the Church of Christ by Leroy Brownlow. Been around a long time, done a lot of good, still teaches the truth. Uh, the one in the middle there, the beginning of our confidence put out by David Farr. Um, it's a seven-week, 49-lesson series designed for the new convert to get in the habit of studying God's Word every day and continuing to grow. Uh, but also, you see on the left there, uh, material that is very useful uh, for personal study and for this type of thing, continuing to help a new Christian grow, uh, is, uh, been, was put out by the Winklers, Wendell Winkler, Dan Winkler, Mike Winkler, life-changing studies uh, with an open Bible. It, it, they have part of that series goes through the New Testament, uh, and part of the series is a topical study dealing with various issues. It can be very, very useful to helpful to, and helpful to a person uh, continue to grow. But beyond even beyond what materials to use for this, there also needs to be a plan, brethren, for us to be in that new Christian's life. Have that new Christian in your home. Have different members of the church have that new Christian in your home. Share a meal together. Read Scripture together. Pray together. That new convert to Christ needs uh, to develop bonds with other members of the church in that congregation. The more bonds that new convert has, the less likely he is to leave. We need to have a plan for that. Now, let's talk briefly about some techniques that we can use. In the one-on-one -on -one teaching situation. We teach in the Fishers and Men course what we call discovery learning or discovery teaching. Um, the concept of teach a person to fish and eat for a lifetime. That's the concept. I don't want to go in and just uh, lecture to them and then back up and see what happens. That might help them for that day, but not long term. I want them to be able to, to take the scriptures on their own at some point and continue to grow. And continue to learn. I love preaching. Don't misunderstand me. I love preaching. I love preachers. But when you're sitting down at someone's kitchen table, that's not sermon time, brethren. So I teach in the fishers of men. We don't lecture. We don't tell when we're sitting down in the one-on-one -on -one situation. We help people to see it and understand it for themselves. We present ways that we can do that. And here's a concept for us. Don't tell your student anything that they can learn for themselves. Now, that's, a, that, that's easy to say that. That's a difficult concept, though. Don't tell your students anything they can learn for themselves. Um, get, what am I there for? I'm, I'm having this Bible study. You're there to guide them in the Scriptures, not to tell them. Help them to see it and understand it. Because when they see it and they understand it for themselves, they're more likely to accept it, they're more likely to remember it, they're more likely to act upon it at that point. So we teach how to do this. Walking through the Scriptures, reading it, having them read it, and asking questions about it so that they can see it for themselves. Um, if you're lecturing to them sitting at their kitchen table, even if you're quoting Scripture and giving the reference, oftentimes they'll see that, oh, that's, that's Tim's opinion. But if they're seeing it for themselves, it's no longer my opinion. They saw it. Also, as this method uh, of teaching is often takes a little bit longer. Sometimes it's harder, but brethren, it is worth it. It is worth the extra time and, the, and, and effort. Because teaching someone is not about how much I know and how much I can tell them. It's about how I can help them learn more effectively. We need to remember that. I mean, that, that takes restraint, though. Now, I'm a member of the Lord's church. I'm a gospel preacher. I know the answer. It takes restraint, not for me to tell them, but help them to walk through it slowly to see it. It takes restraint, but it's more effective. All right, let's talk about student questions. Short on time. Uh, I'll try to do this fairly quickly, but I want you to... This is one of the biggest helps that I can give you as far as 
teaching someone effectively? Because I think it's one of the biggest areas where people are, are afraid of Bible, personal Bible studies. And one of the areas where people tend to make mistakes in personal Bible studies is in the area of questions that their student might ask them. And as I teach in the Fisher's Men training course, there's only five types of questions that somebody can ask you. In, in a Bible study setting, there's only five types of questions that somebody can ask you. The first one is what we call a curiosity question. A curiosity question. Something that they, may, they might want to know, but really it doesn't matter. Here's an example of a curiosity question. Where, where, where did Cain get his wife? Um, well, why, did, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus at night? Why, why go for wood? See, none of that actually matters to eternity, right? But some, it's something that somebody might be curious about and might want to know. How do you respond to a curiosity question? Brethren, don't be afraid to say these next three words. I don't know. <laughs> don't be afraid to say that, especially on a curiosity question, because often, most of the time on a curiosity type question, the Bible doesn't say anyway. So don't be afraid, even if the Bible does say, tell us the answer, if you don't know, don't be afraid to say that. I don't know. Um, uh, in Say, well, is that going to affect eternity? And if a person is honest, they're going to acknowledge, no, it's not going to affect eternity. So we can move on to something that, uh, that affects salvation. The next one is what we call irrelevant. And what, what I mean, don't misunderstand this when I say irrelevant. I do not mean unimportant. This is an important Bible question, but it's not covered. It's irrelevant to your curriculum. It's irrelevant to your study plan is what we mean by that. Uh, an example of that, um, what does the Bible say about Mark of the Beast? Now, is that a Bible subject? Yes, it is. Are you typically going to study that with someone when you're trying to teach them how to be saved? No. That's what we call an irrelevant question. It's irrelevant to your study plan, although it's a Bible subject. How do you respond to that? You say something like, well, that's a great question. I'm glad you're interested in that. And let's study that when we finish with this. You don't mind if we wait till the end, do you? That, that's a leading question. I don't teach you. I don't want you to teach with a leading question, but you use a leading question to keep somebody on task, to keep them focused on the subject at hand. Okay? I'm going to have to move quickly. I could go further on these things. But the next one is what we call a premature question. A premature question is a, a question that's on a Bible subject and you fully intend to cover that. You simply haven't gotten to it yet. Let's say you're on lesson one or two establishing the authority of God, the existence of God, who's Jesus, and they say, why doesn't the Church of Christ use a piano? That's a premature question. You fully intend to cover that. You just haven't gotten there yet. How do you deal with that question? Hey, great question. Glad you're interested in that. That's actually covered in lesson and fill in the blank, whatever it is. And that leading question to keep them on task. You don't mind if we wait till then, do you? But let me take just a moment and, and try and describe why this is so, so important not to jump ahead to premature questions. Because in my experience, there are two areas where brethren like to jump ahead Two premature questions. One of them is the example I just gave, instrumental music. The other one is baptism. Tim, you don't, you don't think we should teach baptism? Yes, of course we can teach baptism. Obviously, yes. But lesson one or two? No! Why not? Well, what's baptism for? The remission of sins. Anything you need to do before you're baptized? you got to have faith. you got to repent of your sins. Why would I study baptism with someone and teach them, you need to be baptized for the remission of sins, when I haven't covered sin with them? They don't even know what it is, what they're guilty of. They don't know how to repent and what that truly means. It doesn't make any sense. But brethren like to do it. But what, we need to have a step-by-step -step plan. If it, the example of instrumental music, if, if you jump ahead to instrumental music and, and you start talking about the New Testament and how it teaches us to sing... If a person just knows a little bit about the Bible, what are they going to do immediately? What about the Psalms? What about David? Uh, and so on and so forth. Now you've got a whole new study on your hands. We need a plan, step-by-step uh, -step progression, so that we can build uh, to these things. I wish I could talk about it more. Um, but the last, uh, excuse me, the number four is what we call a loaded question. A loaded question is any question that puts you on the judgment seat. Do you think only members of the Church of Christ are going to be saved? Do you think my grandmother's lost? Any question that puts you in the place of the judge is what we call a loaded question. Are you the judge? It's not your job. How do you respond to this? Wait, real quickly, there are two ways that people typically respond to loaded questions. One is, one is the, the very, very blunt way. 
How does that go over most of the time? Not well at all. We can do better than that. The other way is what I call the cop-out way. That's when, and I imagine most of us, including myself, before I took Fishers of Men, used the cop-out way. And that's by saying, well, I believe if you do what the Bible says, I believe if you do what God wants you to do, then you'll be saved. Well, now that's a true statement, but I call it the cop-out way because that person leaves the conversation and thinks, uh, yeah, I do what the Bible says. Tim thinks I'm saved. That's not what I wanted to be thinking, brethren. Here's my suggestion on how to deal with a loaded question. Why would you ask me that? That's interesting. Well, I heard something somewhere. I saw something on the internet. My pastor said, my grandmother told me, they saw something or heard something about the Church of Christ. Well, who has the authority to determine who's saved and who's lost? And if you, if you have an honest person, they're going to acknowledge that's God. What opportunities have you had to study what God has said about salvation? Would you like to see what the Bible says? And if they say yes, get yourself a Bible study instead of an argument. If they say, no, I'm not interested in seeing what the Bible says, guess what, brethren? I'm not going to answer their question because they're not sincere. If they're sincere and want to have a Bible study and see what the Word of God says, absolutely I'll study it. I'm not going to just have an argument for the sake of argument, though. There's a difference. And Jesus, I wish I could give an illustration on that and how Jesus did that. Uh, and he used this uh, type of interaction with people. Um, then the last one, last type of student question, questions you can expect is what we call a relevant question. That's a question on the present subject or something you've already covered in the past. And that's the, um, brethren, that is the only type of question you actually need to answer in a Bible study. Now you respond to the other ones. I just gave you suggestions on how to respond. But that's the only question that you actually answer. And because it's on the subject, you've got the material in front of you. And when you go back for lesson two, three, four, whatever number, take those lessons back with you and you can review them as needed. That helps us tremendously with our fear of questions, and we're not jumping ahead and, and covering things and destroying the foundation that we built by jumping ahead to things that we're not ready for. If I had time, I'd go in to teach your questions. I don't have time uh, to tell you how to use uh, questions as a teacher. I guess I'll just have to schedule the Fisher's Men training course. Yes, that's a shameless plug. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but I would teach you how to use these types of questions to be more effective in your teacher. But brethren, Scriptural resources. Let me back up in case somebody wanted to take a picture of those types of questions, even though we're not describing what they are. Um, scriptural resources are available to us, uh, and we need to plan ahead and use them and build uh, in a step-by-step -step progression. The main thing is this, have a plan. That means have a plan for the subject matter you intend to cover and stay the course. That means have a plan with a teaching technique that you're using as well. Understand your student and how to reach them in the most effective way possible. There's a difference between telling somebody and teaching somebody. Help your student, student to see God's truth and understand it for themselves. And let's use our lives and our bodies to bring glory to God as effectively as we can. Thank you so much.